We are sitting here at Whiskey Festival Festival North Netherlands with Tom. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, not bad, not bad. How are you? I'm doing fine. We're we are surrounded by whiskey, so it's always a good start. But absolutely, tell me, like I, I I've had the opportunity to meet you, but for the people at home who don't know you, who are you, and where do you actually work? Because that's a quite interesting story, right? Well, I hope so. Uh, <laughs> that depends on your own judgment. But yeah, no. I, well, my name's Tom Roskams. Uh, I work for Claxons. Uh, we're an independent bottler based in the Lowlands. Uh, just north of Dumfries, where we have all our maturation warehouses and all of our uh, bottling work goes on. And yeah, we are essentially a producer of quite a wide range of different ranges. We have a few examples up front here. And, you know, for us, I guess, you know, we come from a background of uh, whiskey enthusiasm. Passionate about whiskey, always have been. Uh, our families have always been whiskey collectors, cask collectors, okay. and you know, Claxton's ultimately emerged from that passion to, to collect whiskey. And how long have you been working with this passion? Well, you know, <laughs> dedication to whiskey is a lifelong, a okay. lifelong okay. Yeah. thing, I guess, but uh, no, f as a business, eventually we decided once we'd collected enough whiskey that okay. uh, you know, we should take the steps forward to, to set up as an independent bottler. For me, that journey started slightly more recently, but originally Claxton's was founded about 10 years ago, and we've bottling we've been bottling for about seven years now six or seven oh, years seven years we're going to talk about the, like all the different ranges and all the different flavors but i don't like talking about the whiskey without anything to drink sounds good to me we got a, a nice bottle and, and you can tell me a little bit about it and then we dive into to what it is to be an independent bottler because like some people might know or some people might have heard of it but i want to hear the ins and outs but what are we drinking here so we're looking at a 12 year old tormo here which is in the space side region and it's part of our exploration series. Okay. So the exploration series is really designed to help people do exactly that, explore, explore new whiskies. Yeah. And that's all done really at a sort of accessible price point. So we bottle okay. everything at 50%, still high strength. Yes. Perhaps not always cast strength, but very high strength. Okay. And we work with a wide range of different cast types. Okay. So this particular um, Tomo is in a bourbon barrel. Okay. Uh, but we also work with, uh, obviously, Oloroso, PX, rum casks, brandy casks, red wine casks, and also a huge diversity of different cask sizes as well. So right from your sort of blood tub and octave sizes up to, you know, your classic punchins and sherry butts and everything in between. So Something that I have seen quite often within the exploration story, like quarter casks. Yeah. But maybe we're going from all the way, but just... I will ask you to do you, you pour us a glass. Let's pour a dram. Because Indeed. like that's yeah. I, this is always why I like to uh, to to ask <laughs> Yorkshireman to to pour me a dram. <laughs> Sludge. Oh, it is. It smells uh, surprisingly l for like fifty percent. I wouldn't guess. No, I wouldn't have guessed it. Quite floral, I think. Grassy. Yeah. Lots of apples. But it's from the Tormor distillery. Exactly. I never heard about this distillery. Is it something that you do often? Putting like maybe no lesser known distilleries or, or distilleries that often get lost in, in, in blends. Do you also bottle those? Or are you going for the big names? It, it's an absolute mix. And our, our, our goal Perfect. is to, to bottle the widest diversity that we can. And, okay. and particularly the exploration series, it, it's, it's an opportunity for people, including ourselves, to try whiskey from different distilleries with interesting profiles that they may not have tried before. So, okay. you know, of course we bottle um, uh, your sort of well-known distilleries and really strong brands out in the industry, but, you know, lesser known uh, distilleries as well and brands as well. So. Uh, Tomor is an example, or Dalrymple's, um, okay, yeah. you know, different lesser known distilleries are, are certainly part of our goal. Yeah. But talk me through it, like independent bottler, what does that mean? What, what does it involve? For us, it involves working with the wood and maturing the stock, really. That's, okay. the, that's the key thing. So we do everything but distill the spirit. Okay. And for us, the maturation program is, is the kind of key focus on what we do. So we buy in everything from new make. Okay. up to really high age, old vintage uh, casks. Okay. And for us, it's about selecting the, the best examples of each individual spirit type, distillery, but also cask type and profile, and okay. selecting the best example that we can. But what I'm wondering, like, for example, like, let's say that I had a distillery and I will be producing like 500 casks a year, and there will be one cask where I'm like, oh, this is so incredible. It's such a good example of what I'm trying to put out. Why would I sell it to you? Well, if you've created that yourself, they'll probably bottle that themselves yeah exactly but, but I think as I say that look every distillery is 
obviously producing their own product. But there's always excess production, and there always has been in the industry, and all the distilleries trade with each other. And, and Definitely, yeah. You know, we're part of the process of trading casks and working with casks, and we take those casks on, really, to mature them in our own warehouses and take them in the direction that we want to take that spirit in. Okay, so it's, it's, it's you actually put hands on and you actually work with the, the spirit. So it's not only uh, not buying only a cask and just putting in a bottle and... Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. Absolutely and how do you not. make this decision? Because like I can imagine like it's you can say it's gut feeling. Well, is wouldn't, it, is, wouldn't is it, it be uh, wouldn't it be brilliant if there was a sort of mathematical uh, yeah. logarithm to these things? But no, such a thing doesn't exist. It, it's a it's a team consensus. Everyone contributes in our team. The warehouse manager Martin Burnett, my partner Adrian Hoos, all of the warehousing staff, the bottling team, they all contribute to the selection process essentially okay. to add their little bit of expertise and philosophy and their own ideas and input to make sure that we get you know a supportive consensus on, on so these before things. this this actually the liquid hits the bottle how many like how many people have been given notes or have been giving their advice like how many people are hands-on working with this I, I would say the vast majority of our team we're, we're not a big team don't okay. get me okay. wrong okay. we you know <laughs> I, I don't know we, we, we're sort of 12 between 12 and 15 people so okay. uh, we're quite a small team still but we we all get involved you know and okay. the guys who are working with the cast on a daily basis are the ones who really kind of keep an eye on the stock and make sure that you know they get the fantastic job more than I do of, of sampling qu quality checking you know <laughs> Quali quality control is the essential part of the process and what's not to love you know on, on, on quality control and it's it's uh, it's absolutely essential yeah to be honest right, Tom, this is something you, you you might go on a bus but I've heard rumors about your warehouse <laughs> <laughs> about like other roofs no, just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> snipers snipers uh, yeah. and gun turrets 360 no. degree surveillance yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for, for the people at home we, yeah. we, we had a we had a quick laugh about this yesterday but like <laughs> you guys have like how many cask currently do you, you roughly have in yeah, stock? Yeah, of course. The number is always changing, going up and down. It's a guess. I mean, it depends on the cask sizes as well, but I, I would estimate we have somewhere around 2,000 casks. Oh, wow. Some, something of that sort of magnitude. And, and, and to be honest, like we, we have a few different bottles in front of us because like, yeah. I want to quickly talk to him. Like, we talked about the exploration series. Yep. Focus on, on, on exploring new whiskies. Yep. What I was wondering, you said like you bottle at 50%, but w w what if we, um, like Angel Share, uh, decrease in alcohol volume. What happens when it gets below the 50%? Do you also bottle it at, at Exploration Series or is it then immediately? These are a few examples of, of yep. the brands that we work with. So we have other Claxons brands in our range. Okay. If we're bottling at pure cast strength, typically an older age statement, uh -huh. but not always, we often end up bottling in the in the Warehouse Number 1 series. Okay. So these are our decanter range, um, kind of our flagship range, really. It's a beautiful bottle. Um, thank you. It's such yeah. A, it's such a, but you know, I was like, putting this on a shelf, it's just magnificent to, to look at. It's beautiful. That's appreciated. I, we think they stand out. Yeah, you know, they're definitely. quite a definitely. statement piece. They're not uh, perhaps in keeping with the sort of more traditional bottle style, but we've never been ones to sort of conform to uh, exactly how things were done necessarily. Okay. So we like to be a little bit different and perhaps make a bit of a statement, but uh, also we stand out and it's a talking point and that's, you know, that's a good thing. But most importantly, uh, you know, is, is obviously the liquid in the bottle. Yeah. And with the warehouse number one and number, number eight range, which are both in this style, they're sort of the flagship range at cast strength, no chill filtering, no colorants. It, it effectively goes straight from the cask into the bottle, exactly as it was uh, yeah, because in, like in the warehouse. We got a example like right here. It, it, it's from the Tobomori Distillery, 26 year old yeah. uh, sherry bud. Yeah. It's uh, to be honest, I, I was I, I tried it yesterday. I was extremely surprised, but still, like y you said, like the exploration series, it's more about discovering and more being affordable. Yeah. This is more something you give uh, your parents at Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Well, perhaps, maybe, <laughs> maybe more, more, more sort of gifts and things like that. But you know, also, it, it really depends on you know your affordability. And for us, it's about providing uh, access to as many people as possible. Okay. With you know, depending on how deep your pockets are, um, sure. you know, we want to make sure that everybody can try something from Claxtons, and okay. you know, that involves having a, a wide range of prices. I guess you know, Definitely. it's as simple as that. Definitely, yeah. and and you. you what is and now we're getting more a little bit personal because I want to hear it from like you like mm. what do you think that are like more the pros and cons of being an independent bottler compared to 
producing itself because like yes you'll have your opportunities to to work around with it and, and, and play with it but you still need to work with the spirit you actually yeah. have been given well there's certainly pros and cons no doubt about it let's start with the cons I guess I mean one okay. of the big cons is you know we're not producing our own spirit so that leads to challenges definitely you know there's always an advantage I guess on some level to being able to distill and produce something that is of a particular profile but ultimately turn the taps on and, and, and fill your casks yeah definitely but that said we are buying in new make spirit that we mature so uh, as long as we manage that process and manage our supply correctly then then you know that's okay the pros yeah the big pro the big pro the big pro is the diversity okay. i mean we, we if you're a whiskey fan and a whiskey enthusiast like we all are we get to work with everything right across the board i think the distilleries do a fantastic job but they're perhaps more restricted to a few different profiles based on their uh, distillation setup and capabilities so you know they're limited to maybe a smaller number of, of uh, uh, distillery releases yeah. and that's fine they're, they're often spectacular yeah. um, but there's limitations to that okay. whereas for us the sky's you know, the limit yeah basically. the sky's the limit the okay. sky's the limit so and that's what's exciting if you're into whiskey as a whole it's an opportunity to, to work with all the spirits, all the regions, all the cast types, you know, and, and keeps and it fun. And, and region, like you guys are situated in the lowlands. That's right, yeah. We've been talking about maturation, and maturation is a big deal for you guys. Yes. Is maturing a whiskey in the lowlands, does it affect compared to, for example, say like if you would buy a warehouse on an island or on more in, the, in on top of a mountain or whatever? That's a huge question, and we could probably do a, a <laughs> several hours okay. just discussing that point. I mean, look, we're, we're in a stunning location on the Dalswinton estate in, in the lowlands. Uh, we're on the banks of the River Nif, okay. near to the Solway, so we're not too far from the coast. You know, it, it's an amazing environment and, you know, super clean and in a, in a really nice space. There's no doubt it's a wonderful place to mature whiskey. Definitely, definitely. Exactly how that influences profile? Well, there's huge debate on that. Everybody knows that. And there's lots and lots of variables. Lots of variables. And what are some What are some things that in influence this? What, well, well, I, I want to get, get into the nitty gritty. Yeah, let's, I get, wanna let's get into some nitty gritty. So, so certainly temperature is a big thing and temperature okay. fluctuation will have a big effect. Humidity levels as well, that will affect whether you, know, you see more angel share of perhaps uh, the water yep. as opposed to the alcohol content so that will affect abv strength the type of warehouse is a big thing so we have several different warehouses we have your sort of traditional style dunnage uh, stone uh, earthen floor warehouses just really quickly for people who mm. might not know or might not have visited a dunnage warehouse yeah what is a dunnage warehouse so a dunnage is, is typically a, a very low-lying sort of stone structure okay uh, that regulates temperature so you see a lot more uh, a lot less sorry temperature fluctuation it's more consistent okay. more yeah. consistent and then we have sort of old grain uh, stores on site with okay. racking systems okay yeah and then we also have more modern warehousing as well okay so i think that provides us with a kind of interesting niche in the sense that we can move stock between those different oh, okay. warehouses and different conditions so if you've got a, a less active cask for example you might yeah. think well we need to inject a bit of a bit of life into this cask yeah. so you might move it into the sort of more modern space to kind of experience a bit more temperature movement it's still scotland we're not talking about maturing in india or australia uh, israel but, or whatever. But, yeah, yeah. you know you might inject a bit more life because of the fluctuation okay whereas you know you might have an older vintage it's lower in abv you're looking at a longer maturation program for a certain type and of spirit put it in a dunnage warehouse and you'd be back into the dunnage it and it'll be much slower more gradual so you can kind of influence how the cask matures over a different time period is it is it for me wrong to say that you can by choosing a warehouse you can choose what you want to do with the spirits like y if you like i can imagine if you say like okay we got a link wood on oloroso quarter casks if you put something on an oloroso quarter cask i can imagine you say like we want to give it a whack ton of flavors yeah i mean look you can never uh, guarantee the outcome ever okay okay and that there, there is the wonderful world of, of whiskey you know that's impossible but of course you can influence and you can use experience and expertise to to guide the process i think the key for us is we always ensure we've got access to all of our casts so we're not kind of you know stacking huge volumes of casts on top of each other not able to access them yeah. all of our individual casts in our warehouse they're all accessible individually okay. so we can check them up all the time every, at any point in time, time. Okay. and that's really key for us because if you're trying to sort of guide the cask in the right direction you have to be able to you know monitor and manage that process really so i don't know if that's an ambiguous answer to your your no, question no, no. but certainly you can guide 
And certainly you have experience and, you know, a track record and some, you know, you get a feel for what spirit types will work with different casts and what might be a little bit, let's say, adventurous or, or a little bit risky. Yeah. But you can never guarantee the outcome. You know, and that's, that's kind of the fun. That's what keeps us on our toes, I guess. You know? I heard once uh, somebody who, who's more into the blending side of things, uh -huh. less to the maturing side, saying like making a whiskey, to, like putting together something for in a bottle, it's part science and part magic. Yeah. And he said it's closer to magic than to <laughs> science because there's so much thing we don't know. Yeah. Is it is it true for you? Is it also is it like sometimes that something completely surprised you that it totally went the other way? Or is it that you say like we currently are at, at a point where we know what our warehouses do, what our casks do, what we can expect? And is it more to the to the science or is it still big on to the magic? Great question. Yeah, sure. I mean, there are certain parts of any company process, if you like, if you want to get a bit more sort of process driven that you can kind yeah. of control, of course. Okay. But, you know, we have a blending lab on site as well, where cool. we do much more controlled sort of Peace. testing yeah. and, and all sorts of things like that. But, you know, I'm well and truly in the camp of it's it's more magic than 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 science can you give me an example like something that surprised you oh something that surprised me something like um, where you're like i did not know this could happen like in a whiskey or in a cask yeah that's a good question as well so i've got to think about that one i mean certainly i think what's been really interesting for me uh -huh. is is working with some of the smaller casks where particularly the, particularly the quarter yeah quarter casks or the octaves you know you can you can generate a really interesting influence in a uh, slightly shorter time frame and that can have positive and negative uh, effects no doubt I mean we've had some disasters okay a absolutely you know and I, I won't name names because it's not fair on the uh, original mm. distillers but we we've definitely had some disasters and you have to be frank about that and say well that's that's a test gone wrong and, and we're not happy to bottle that but you know unless you experiment a little bit uh, you're never gonna find those little pearls those little gems so, so it's like for example something that went like too much wood or too much overly wooded okay. overly influenced the, the spirit wood ratio was too high and left okay. for too long or you know of course cask can sour or they go in a direction that you don't expect so okay. you know the, the finished profile might end up with certain characteristics that you, you just weren't expecting you know or you can over influence definitely what you don't okay. want to do in our view is is sort of masked the original spirit that you're working with you want okay. to retain some of those the character key of the characters yeah absolutely okay. you know that's really important i think so it, it's about balance but no doubt we've had some successes and failures with time we hope a lot more more successes, successes than failures. okay yeah, yeah, yeah i mean the what the key thing for us is nothing goes into the bottle unless we're we're you know 100 percent happy yeah there's one more bottle here on my side it's from girvin yes it is a great it's, it's a grain whiskey yeah more particular is a lowland distillery yeah and some Something that I heard from you, like y you want to put Lowlands back on the map, 100%. And, and to be honest, like talk me through, like why? Why? Like we got so much distilleries going on. Why? Why do people need to know more about Lowlands? I think the Lowlands has been undervalued for for a long, long time, and okay. perhaps it doesn't have the sort of the aesthetics of you know Isla or or the Highlands or or, or Speyside. So, but actually, it's. The Lowlands has been a powerhouse for the whiskey industry for many, many years. I think maybe it's been treated more as the sort of industrial backbone of, of, of the industry, if we're frank. And but, but because there are a lot of grain distilleries there. There are, there are, and, and grains obviously form a, a large component of blends, and yeah. blends is still your biggest constituent yeah. of the overall industry. But Maybe you know, we as like, we really love whiskey and we, we go more to the single, even to the single malt, single casks, but I, I think like the biggest portion is still like blended scotch. This well, and grain as, uh, grain as well, I mean, I think a single grain is not given the justice it deserves. Okay. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I think, <laughs> you know, typically single grains are more robust distillates okay. uh, and distillation processes and you know typically they require a, a longer maturation period but okay. you can still have fantastic single cask grain bottlings i mean we've bottled a girvin you've mentioned there yeah. we've bottled canvas strathclyde cameron bridge and met many many more so and you know how are you guys like putting lowlands back on the map well for starters it's it's where we're based and it's where we put all of our time and energy into so that that's a fundamental part of it but i think also we want to create a bit of a, a lowland trail really obviously there are plenty of distilleries setting up as well independent bottlers like our, ourselves and lots of guys who are starting to focus on the lowlands as a region i think you know, there'll be a lot more events that we're trying to plan in the near future, which okay. I'll talk about with you in, 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 in the near future. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's just working hard to promote what the Lowlands can deliver because it is also a stunning, stunning region, particularly along the Solway. Yeah. 
and promoting grain and single grain is, is part of that process for us. I mean, certainly we think, and, I, and I'm a huge fan of, of single grain, uh -huh. uh, you get that sort of tropical fruits and kind of classic kind of boiled sweet sort of elements and really kind of quite vibrant, complex whiskies yeah. if you catch them at the right time. The key thing is, is bottling something at, at exactly the right, the right point. Time. And grain and single grain bottlings deliver a huge amount of value for, I, I take that Gervin, if you wanted a, yeah. uh, a 30-year-old single malt, it the, will be the, expensive. The, it'd yeah. be super expensive, but that, that Gervin is much more accessible for people who are, you know, perhaps have a bit less, but bit less income to, but to, yeah, to, no, to but spend to on a whiskey. You know? to, to be honest, like we, we get to the final bottle here. Uh, the grain barn. This was literally yesterday, the first day here at the, the festival. My first dram of the day was yep. this grain barn. Yep. It's a 30 year old single grain. Yes. It was 95 pounds in the UK, I believe. Something, something like that. Yeah, it, yeah. Yep. Yep. So it's, it's, it's comp like if, if, if you want to get a single mold for 30 years, yeah. it's. Well, not possible. <laughs> <laughs> not, for, not, not, not for another hunch, no. Definitely not. Yeah. So, but why is it so cheap? I think it's been undervalued. Okay. I don't think it'll be like that forever, actually. I think, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, people who are switching on to this are realizing that actually single grain has a lot to offer. And uh, hopefully we're sort of early to the table in trying to be part of that process. But, you know, as I say, typically, historically, single grain has been sort of a much more robust, um, often continuous distillation process. Yeah. And... Uh, more volume orientated and less kind of single cask, small batch, you know, quality driven, I but, guess. But, but still, uh, yeah, yeah. But still, you can find some real gems. So, I mean, we've created uh, a really beautiful small scale vatting, actually, in this instance with the okay. grain barn, which, you know, we're really very proud of. And we think it brings something to the table that, you know, not, not many whiskies would actually. It has unique characteristics, yeah. which are, you know, really, really quite interesting and for a great price. So. And, and I want to just may maybe annoy you a bit <laughs> <laughs> go for it i gotta try this hit me we we normally drink during the podcast episode we drink mm. it neat are there whiskies where you're like you know drinking whiskey neat is perfect but this you gotta try it a different way are there like things where you like we can enjoy a whiskey also in a different type of way do you got tips on yeah that? i'm trying to well look absolutely i would never and we as a company would never preach to people on how they should have their whiskey that's the okay. that's the first thing i would say okay uh you know for me okay maybe i'm a bit old school cash strength and i'd stick to that but there's no doubt that you know adding a bit of water sometimes can really do some interesting things i'm thinking back to one of the ben nevis bottlings we did okay, yeah and i remember agent and i sat in a hotel trying to write tasting notes on that bottling and it took us the best part of an hour <laughs> to get anywhere with it in the end i think we gave up because it was just evolving over time and Okay. You know, and every time we went back to it, and it was another dram and another dram, and like this is changing again. And, and as you added more water, it, 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 it also changed. So the evolution of the whiskey was incredible. And you know, they have quite a robust distillation process as well, but also really complex whiskey with lots of different characteristics. And, and adding some water in that instance definitely brought something to the table. So you know, yeah, we're very used to cast strength whiskey. Yeah. And that's kind of where we lean to. But sometimes maybe I tell myself, perhaps I'm missing out on something here by not. Yeah. Uh, Trying with each dram, yeah, you know. I see that the doors are slowly getting to open and people are slowly mm. getting in. So I, I need to get really quickly to the essence. Like I wanna wanna know from you if, if, if anything was possible. Literally anything. You can say anything. What would you like to put out with Clexton's? Or what would you like to try? Maybe not like for you said like an experiment, it can succeed and can fail. Do you know what I'm gonna get a bit sentimental here, but okay. um go for it. I think what I'm looking for there are many, many things that I'm looking forward to. Many and we you know Lots of things I could talk about, but for me, uh, whiskey is quite a sort of emotional topic in a way. We we connect with it in different ways, and everyone has their sort of story and their memories of, of whiskey and when they were drinking whiskey with pals definitely. or yeah, family. Definitely, definitely. And I've got a couple of personal casts that are, that are in the warehouse. It's uh, a Longmorn and a Ben Reek, and they're of the vintage of my my two kids. Oh, okay. And and I guess you know what I'm looking forward to is when they're 18, bottling, bottling them, it. putting them in the op Put them, put them into bottle, celebrating that moment. And, you know, I, I think between age and I, actually, we have five kids between us. And I think, okay. you know, we're quite excited to see, you know, them get involved in the company in, in uh, a few you, years' time and, and kind of contribute to things. So, Do you, do you yeah. feel like this is the next generation of Claxtons? I hope so. I mean, I've got no plans to retire, but yeah. <laughs> no, 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 but is it, what, is, yeah. it, is, it, is it something that you actually grow on, that you want to, like, teach your kids, yeah. give them guidance, and then let them continue with all the, the, the uh, 6,000 warehouses you're building? Yeah, but I, I, look, absolutely. We want to 
create a bit of a legacy, I guess. But also, I mean, for us, it's it's not just about passing that on. It's about us also being part of that process, restoring the bond uh, in the lowlands and continuing to learn ourselves, actually. Okay. You know, we, we don't put ourselves on pedestals. We don't treat ourselves as industry gurus or anything like that. We're or certainly from my point of view, you know, we're, we're whiskey enthusiasts like everybody at the festival. And, you know, we just have a special opportunity with Claxton's and Al Swinton Bond to continue learning really ourselves, continue exploring good whiskey, enjoying good whiskey with friends. And, you know, that to us is, is gold dust. You can't yeah. you can't buy that. You know, I think that that is a beautiful way to end. There were so many things that we didn't talk about. We're not talking about the gold coins. We're not talking about all the, the, the ins and outs. But I think that w with this last way, you described it perfectly. For everyone at home uh, who is listening to this, where can they find you? Like, where can they contact you on social medias? Yeah, we're in uh, on all the social media channels. So Facebook, obviously, and Instagram, and, and obviously the That's website. Klexons, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, if, if you're in the Netherlands, in, in, in Holland, uh, our importer is High Spirits. So if you're interested in what we do or interested interested in some of our bottlings, please, please get in touch with the yep. guys at High Spirits, Ihab and uh, Yessa and, and Franz and yep. Hans. Great guys, really uh, fantastic to work with them. So uh, we, we, we really appreciate you guys getting in touch, talking to us, telling us about Claxton's, telling us about what you enjoy. So, And I think the one thing I'd like to say is just thank you, essentially. Thank you to you and thank you to all our followers. For us, we're a small family business. So, you know, every bottle that we sell actually counts. And, and every bottle that we sell and what we make from that goes back into the business. It goes back into more spirit for more bottlings in the future. And so, more casks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we really do appreciate it, genuinely. And uh, yeah. Tom, thank you so much. Pleasure. We'll grab thank another you. dram or two or three. We'll see what happens. And to Cheers. everyone at home, thank you so much for listening and watching this episode. See you on the next one. This was the first episode here from Whiskey Festival Nord Nederland. There are two more to come, so keep an eye out. And uh, definitely keep an eye out for Claxton's. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.